I was destined to be a supervillain, and we were destined to be rivals. The concept of rivals is nothing new in gaming. When going on long journeys or trading blows with powerful foes, it's inevitable that two entities of similar skill would occasionally clash from time to time. With many different iterations of this concept, we're narrowing the criteria down to a few rules. Firstly, the rivalry has to be reoccurring and acknowledged to some degree. Can't just have any old big monster with nothing to speak on. Second, they have to be similar, but also contrast with each other. What are the fundamental parts of them that make their conflict so interesting? Third, there has to be a lengthy history of why they're set on a trajectory to butt heads. Lastly, the quality of the encounters. How satisfying are their clashes with each other? cute when some rivalries just start as kids fighting on the playground. To bad screen, it's puberty edge comes in and ruins it. Oh, it's really been a while since I made any KH reference in my countdowns. I didn't think I mentioned them when I talked about Square Enix's fails for 2023. Man, I'm slacking. So, Sora and Riku. The playground brawl between friends turned into who can impress the girl more? Yeah, you forget that Kyrie just came out of nowhere one day and the two started tripping over themselves to impress her. Unfortunately, the Virgin Riku didn't stand much of a chance against the Chad Sora. And that's why he decided to open a door to darkness that swallowed up his entire world. Man, keep your hormones in check, Riku. Well, uh, <laughs> it got worse. Riku met Maleficent, who used Riku's jealousy of Sora to increase his darkness and allow Ansem to possess our dear boy. Yes, I know Maleficent didn't know about Ansem's possession, but it still happened from her actions. Or did she know? I don't know. I don't want you guys calling me out on another KH mistake after worse villains. Trust me, this lore is hard to keep up with and as it is. Anyways, this led Riku going from wanting to save Kairi to just wanting to be better than Sora. Sora, on the other hand, wanted to be like Riku. He thought Riku was better at everything than him already and just wanted to be as good as him. This led to clashes between the two in Hollow Bastion where Sora had to fend off an Ansem possessed Riku in one of the harder but more satisfying fights in the game. Well, it's satisfying now that we can skip cutscenes. <laughs> After the first game though, the rivalry between the two kind of fizzled. Ever Sora vs Riku fight after that was either a data version or Riku replica. It's even more satisfying when you can beat it the first time. <laughs> well, there was that one exception in KH2 where Riku challenged Sora in the Land of Dragons, but he was just playing around at that point. Riku felt guilty for what he did and spent the rest of the series trying to make up for it. The two finally had an honest conversation in Kingdom Hearts 2's ending where they finally admitted their feelings of jealousy towards the other. Riku even finally let go of the past and moved forward in Dream Drop Distance. In fact, Riku seems to feel guilty at the times he surpasses Sora. And yeah, Sora still has some reservations about his actions. Hopefully, we'll see the culmination of that in KH4 if it ever comes out. While the brunt of it was in the first game, the relationship between the two and the competitive streak that they had even after is still a major set piece in the series. The consequences of which get some serious mileage. Didn't matter if it was replica or data form, these two still butt heads not just as rivals, but also great friends. Enjoy the friendly rivalry for now as we go to some of the more violent ones in a bit. Rivals, don't tell me I got time for the King of Fighters storyline is divided into sagas. Each has its own hero, villains, and rival. Out of all of them, the definitive rivalry is still between Kyo and Yori. 
Kyo is the classic shonen protagonist, an ordinary high school student who happens to be a member of the Kusanagi clan, thus granting him fire powers. Iori is the classic shonen rival, a user of the dark flames who hails from the rival clan to Kyo's, the Yagamis. Heck, even their themes in 99 are mirrors of each other. Hundreds of years before the story even began, the two clans had a massive falling out when one of the Kusanagis was framed for killing one of the Yagamis. As a result, the Yagami clan made a pact with Orochi to gain more power at the cost of their sanity. This rivalry continues well into the modern day, with Yori having an unquenchable urge to murder Kyo, and Kyo just wanting Yori to back off. At nearly any King of Fighters tournament, it's a near guarantee you'll see them duking it out. Even when given the opportunity to give up his powers and lead a normal life, Yori refuses. But, like all good rivals, they're willing to put aside their differences when an even greater foe emerges. A hey, granted, Yori is only willing to go through with it thanks to Chizuru urging him. The only real thing that holds back Kyo and Yori is how little their dynamic has progressed over the series. Yori is still at Kyo's throat nearly 30 years after his debut. You'd think that them teaming up to save the world twice would have gotten them to finally bury the hatchet. I mean, I'm not saying they need to be buddy-buddy with each other, but some kind of change or development would be... Not like that! Guilty Gear's cast has been through quite a lot. In the series' 25-year run, we've seen the grow and change in all kinds of ways. And if there's anyone who's seen the most growth, it's the main duo of Saul and Kai. Everything about these two perfectly contrasts each other. Their designs, their personalities, and even their playstyles. In the backstory, Saul was once a member of the Holy Knights alongside Kai. Even back then, conflict was already brewing between them. Saul wanted to do things his way, and Kai did everything by the book. Eventually, Saul grew impatient with his and deserted Holy Knights altogether, taking the legendary Fire Seal with him. From then, the rivalry would only continue. In X, the two of them clashed over how to deal with the newly emerged Dizzy. Saul saw her as just another bounty, while Kai saw her as someone who deserved understanding. After that, Saul and Kai would undergo development, both as individuals and as rivals. Saul became less of an a-hole, while Kai became less authoritarian. Together, they began to build up a sense of mutual understanding and respect. By the time Overture rolls around, Kai trusts Saul enough to act as a surrogate grandfather to his kid. And because Kai is married to Saul's daughter, Dizzy, it makes the two of them father and son. Kai! Ah! Ah! Boy, technicalities are fun. Also, can we take just a minute to appreciate how epic their versus theme and overture was? Seriously, just listen to it. It is said that man's greatest enemy is himself. For only when we vanquish our own demons can we truly prosper. Evidently, Luke and Ash took that one a bit literally. At the beginning of the story, Luke and Ash are as far from each other as you can get. Luke is a whiny young nobleman, and Ash is a military commander! It's not until the end of the first act when they finally meet, and realize they look and sound exactly alike. Gee, the rival is an evil version of the main character. How original! Well, not exactly. For you see, Ash 
isn't the replica. Luke is. When Ash, then known as Luke, was younger, he was kidnapped by Van and replaced by an identical replica. Said replica pretty much took over his life while the person now known as Ash was turned into Van's servant. Luke, being a replica, has no memory of any of this and is seemingly antagonized for no reason. As the game goes on and Luke becomes a better person, he seeks to end his rivalry with Ash so they can work together. Ash adamantly refuses. And can you really blame him? He had his entire life taken away from him and was molded into a servant by the guy that did it. Despite that, he is willing to begrudgingly cooperate with Luke when the chips are down. Sadly, Ash never fully converts to the hero side and it costs him his life as a result. Out of all the entries here, Luke and Ash are easily the most tragic example of a rivalry. Had Ash been willing to swallow his pride and cooperate, things might have ended up better for him. The only real slight against Luke and Ash is that since they only have one canonical game together, the rivalry doesn't get to be explored as much as the others. But <laughs> since said game is a 50 hour long JRPG, yeah, they still earned their place on this list. I'm Mr. Ice Ninja, I'm Mr. Chill, I'm Mr. Spine Ripper, I'm Mr. Frosty Kill. Friends call me Sub-Zero, whatever I punch, turns to snow with a CRUTCH! I'm too much. I'm Mr. Flame. Ninja, I'm Mr. Spear. I'm Mr. Hellfire. I'm Mr. Get Over Here. They call me Scorpion. Whatever I punch burns to ash with a touch. <laughs> I'm too much. Too much. Okay, when did I become the Weird Al of video games? But yeah, at face value, that's this rivalry in a nutshell. Fire, ice, and fisticuffs. Two iconic titans in the Mortal Kombat franchise, Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Having been around since the early Mortal Kombat days, they made their debut as color-swapped frenemies who have had it out for each other since day one. But over time, the lore between these two evolved beyond just palette-swapped foes. They represent two rival clans, Sub-Zero hailing from the Ling Kuei of China and Scorpion from the Shirai Ryu of Japan. But tensions really grew when the sorcerer Quan Chi hired both clans to retrieve an artifact. The two ninjas met on the battlefield and Sub-Zero emerged the victor, while Scorpion wasn't so good. Quite dead, really. But Quan Chi decides he's not quite done with Scorpion yet and brings him back, bringing him the grim news that Sub-Zero killed his family and clan. So Scorpion decides an eye for an eye and a death for a get over here and returns the favor by killing his longtime foe. Is this the end? I guess so. Oh wait, there's a bunch more. Oh yeah, story don't end there, kiddies, because now Sub-Zero's younger brother decides it's his turn for a revenge story and takes his fallen sibling's mantle. And, ooh, the can of worms he opens along the way. For one, Quan Chi decided to play God again and turned the OG Sub-Zero into his new puppet warrior, Noob Saibot. And it also turns out that Quan Chi was the one who really wiped out Scorpion's clan just to snuff out Sub-Zero. Recognizing their common foe, Scorpion and the new Sub-Zero cast aside their differences and band together to undercut the real puppeteer behind their whole feud. But, of course. Of course, 2023 meant new reboot time, which means a clean slate for the rivalry to begin anew. It's kinda sad because the drama and hype they gave the original were amazing, taking essentially two color-swapped sides of the same coin, fleshing their differences in elements, cultures, and tribes, and really ramping up the drama between them. And to it, most of the drama was caused by an outside source, all before arriving at a satisfying conclusion where they snuff out the actual threat. The fact that this beat between them lasted over 27 years and was arguably the most developed in the series speaks volumes for a fighting game. I mean, as the name implies, fighting is pretty much the norm. But seeing it actually get personal like this only well, makes it better. Stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> Always makes me laugh. 
I cannot believe we made it this far into the countdown and haven't once mentioned a single Capcom game. Uh, let's fix that. Mega Man Battle Network takes some of the core Mega Man ideas and puts it in a Kodomo setting, complete with the three best friends gang and the villains of the week formula. And as usual with these setups, there is a major rivalry. And given how many installments the series has, it's interesting to see how far this one develops. Lanny Cotty is an ordinary boy with a net navy just like anyone else. I mean, he's only the son of the most renowned scientist in the world, fights terrorists and criminal masterminds on a weekly basis, and his net navy, MegaMan.exe, is basically cyber god, so <laughs> no biggie. But he wouldn't have gotten that far if he wasn't challenged by Eugene Chaud, or Chaud Blaze in the anime. I don't know, I guess I didn't think Eugene is a cool name. Anywho, Chaud is a big shot net battler who fights crimes across the net alongside his loyal companion, protoman.exe. He doesn't take kindly to land third partying on his assignments and always tries to put him out of commission during the first two games. Though Shad was always the instigator of their fights, Land does have a fascination for how formidable he is. So much so that in the third game, he goes out of his way to study the guy, only to find out that Shad isn't just a natural born pro, he's been training just as rigorously as anyone else. It puts him in a relatable scope that made Lan appreciate him more. Meanwhile, Shad's not a fan of Mega Man constantly giving Proto Man the good old System 32. A lot of that because he had a lot of expectations to live up to for his father's sake. It didn't help his ego much knowing that Lan and Yuichiro had a better son and father relationship than his own. But over time, he does grow to respect Lan more as they fight alongside each other again and again. Not to mention the fact that Lan would save Shad's father from Mad Dog Wannabe here. Putting aside their jealousy for each other in favor of a healthy rivalry, Lan and Shad would start doing missions together. They even save each other's net navy when one gets possessed by Dark Soul. Eventually, it all comes together in Team Proto Man. You can tell how much Shad values Lan's companionship when not only did he assign Lan as the first member to lead his missions, but when Mega Man gets captured, Sean is willing to assign Lan his own net Navi partner. Yes, he gives Proto Man his blood and sweat to his rival. Now, sure, Beryl does the same thing in Team Colonel, but that's mainly because he knew about Lan's accomplishments and used him as, well, an asset. Shad gets slapped in the face by the same guy he's been given a cold shoulder to for months, and he still trusts Lan to pick up his marbles and do his job right. After everything these two have been through together, this is the payoff they deserve. For a standard anime-esque rivalry, Lan and Shad are really well developed. Every confrontation between the two always adds up to how much they would grow and learn from each other. Sometimes simple formulas open an avenue for writers to delve into nuanced interactions, and this is a fine example of that. Finally, we could get back to the more friendly rivalries. And nothing's more friendly than the kid-friendly Pokemon, right? Just don't read the Pokedex entries. And guys, come on, Pokemon being here should be the least surprising. We literally have a whole subtype of trainer called The Rival. If only someone did a tier list on that, plug plug. And yeah, similar to that list, it would be a travesty if we didn't put the OG Red versus Blue. You ever wonder why we're here? It's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? No, not that one. It kind of fell off. Ever since Gen 1, Blue has been the antagonistic rival. He was always ahead of you when clearing gyms. He always gave you the stink eye and told you that he would smell you later. Like, why would you smell me? That's weird. His team was pretty strong too. Too bad he kept losing to Red all the time. Didn't matter that he beat each gym first. Didn't even matter they became the champion before you. You, as Red, would come in and beat him no matter what. And when he loses as champion right after becoming it, he is crushed. And then having his own grandfather give him a verbal smackdown. Ouch! Now what does Red think about all this? Well, uh, being a silent pro tag don't help. If we go by the Origins anime or the Adventures manga, the rivalry was much more one-sided to Blue as Red struggled to defeat his rival until the champion battle. It was similar to Sora and Riku where Red respected Blue, but instead of it being friendly, Blue was just being a jerk usually. So Red's competitive spear was also a lot less friendly compared to the KH duo. It works better since once the two face off at the end of the game, it finally shows Red becoming a true master. Not only becoming the champion, but also defeating the one person who he was trying to surpass, 
even if it was humiliating for Blue as a result. In more modern games, Red and Blue seem to be on more friendly terms. Blue actually grew from his encounter, taking on a more passive approach towards battling. He still only cares about winning and is full of himself at times, but he knows there's more to battling than winning. There's a scene in Pokemon Master EX where Red, Blue, and Leaf are training together as a team for a tournament. Even though they're all on the same team, Blue still wants to fight Red despite them having an important match coming up. Blue knows it's selfish, but he doesn't want to be the sidekick to Red. He wants to be Red's rival and be equal to him. When Blue leaves, Red calls out to him, accepting it. It's such a great scene between the two that makes me mad it's at a gacha game. The Red talking at all is weird. Red and Blue is Pokemon's default defining rivalry for a reason. While there may be better developed characters or deeper motivations down the line, just wiping the floor with your smug neighbor is cathartic as heck. Wait, hang on. Master shows more development for N and Silver? Also, why is the music so good? And why is your player character's canon Pokemon team Pikachu, Torchic, and Solgaleo? You can't even evolve to Torchic? This game is weird. By the early 2000s, Sega decided that it wasn't enough to have their iconic blue blur entice the kitties simply by being a cocky, hip, chili dog eating speedster who doesn't play by the rules. No, what he really needed was an antithesis. Not just another enemy like Eggman, no, but someone on almost equal footing with the blue hedgehog, but with his own conflicting agenda. Well, with Knuckles having turned buddy buddy with Sonic and Metal Sonic bordering more towards villain with an identity crisis, there was only one way to go. Aww, are you edgy? Is you a little edgy edgelord? And thus was born Shadow the Edgehog, I mean, Hedgehog, a near perfect counterpart to Sonic. Eh, might want to take a number there, buddy. On the surface, Shadow's the poster child for edgelords, a broody, emotionally complex, downright dark little bean who hates the world. Oh, and in his own title game, he has a motorcycle and a gun! Because Sega spells subtlety with an X. To the extreme! Alright, alright. Beneath all the Hot Topic mascot jokes, Shadow is actually an interesting character. An artificially created hedgehog made with the purpose of finding a cure for an ailing little girl's disease. Sadly, he failed and his heartbreak turned to anger as he vowed to make humanity suffer for his anguish. Then good old Eggman woke him up and he found himself at odds with our own blue blur and the rest is history. The reason Shadow really earned the title as Sonic's arch rival is because they really do feel like two sides of the same coin. Shadow's obviously more serious and grouchy, but he shares a bit of Sonic's cockiness to the point where he arrogantly says that Sonic's copying him. Yet at the same time, you can tell there's no real malice between them and their friendly rivalry enables Shadow to grow past the edgy marketing, turning into a dependable ally when needed and even into a good mentor for Silver. He truly is the Vegeta to Sonic's Goku. Wait, does that make Knuckles the Piccolo? Related to a lot of mysticism, former rival, the big green, oh, oh wait, we were talking about Shadow. Speaking of, I think that's kind of the one minor nitpick to Shadow's involvement. Considering Knuckles was first in the non-robo rival squad, Shadow kind of made him feel superfluous. Kind of sad considering Knuckles' own backstory before becoming Sonic's other bestie. Still, at least both remain large parts of Sonic's life and the franchise. More so thanks to the movies. A secret research facility. It was a black site, sir. Someone worked very hard to keep this hidden. My god. Project Shadow. Oh, I can't wait. Don't tell me I got time for it. Okay, Ace Attorney time. Are you surprised it's this high? You really shouldn't be. All you do in these games is go to trial with rival prosecutors to defend your client. And of course, we gotta talk about the real rivalry we got going on. Phoenix Wright versus Miles Edgeworth. We start all the way back to when they were children. Wow, we got a lot of childhood friends turned rivals here. Edgeworth saved Phoenix from getting in trouble as a kid, and since then, the two have been close friends. Too bad Daddy Edgeworth died, and Kid Edgeworth got adopted by Manfred von frickin' Karma. 
And anyone who knows him knows that being raised by that sociopath is going to leave some lingering pains. When Edgeworth and Phoenix finally reunited as adults, it was when Phoenix was still a beginner lawyer, defending his mentor sister on the crime of sororicide. And then his childhood friend, who he saw as his inspiration to become a lawyer, was a prosecutor using deviousness to win his case. Yeah, Edgeworth, that autopsy report really was out of date. We can't just do that! If it wasn't for actual divine intervention, Phoenix would have lost. Edgeworth isn't all that bad, though. He actually helped you once or twice in Case 3, but when Case 4, the first game hits, Edgeworth becomes the defendant, and yeah, we need to defend him. Seeing Phoenix do just that and finding out his mentor and father figure killed his actual father really made Edgeworth go into a downward spiral. He left claiming death, causing Phoenix to curse his name for running away. But in a surprising twist, Edgeworth came back with a real renewed outlook. He sought the truth more than anything else. He didn't want to gain a guilty verdict. He wanted there to be no doubt to his theory. He even talked Phoenix what it meant to be a lawyer in the last case of Justice for All when Phoenix was forced to defend a murderer. It's an amazing redemption plug where the rival actually surpasses the protagonist, but not in an antagonistic way. After this, Phoenix and Edgeworth trust in each other as close friends and rivals. While they're on their own paths, they still think of each other when the going gets rough and what they would do in those situations. I'll admit in Dual Destinies and Spirit of Justice, Edgeworth does seem like he reverted a bit in his development, but I say he matured. He was a prosecutor during the dark age of the law and had to claw his way through public opinion to get where he was. But when Phoenix does finally prove his case, Edgeworth will relent because he still trusts in him to fight for his client, as Phoenix trusts Edgeworth to give him everything he has. Ryu and Ken, Street Fighter. Iconic, but super friendly compared to others. Raiden and Jetstream Sam from Metal Gear Rising, hyped for the revengeance, but Armstrong stole the show after. Kirby and Meta Knight and King DDD from Kirby. Kirby kind of has a thing for taking selfish, greedy a-holes and cold, stoic warriors and melting their hearts after beating them up. 9S and A2, near half misunderstanding, half corruption, all Yoko Taro stroking his ego. Deservedly. Fox and Wolf from Star Fox, a literal dogfight over who's the better pilot. I hate how clever that pun is. Pit and Dark Pit from Kid Icarus. What starts as Pit's dark reflection for his repressed need for freedom ends up being just an edgelord twin brother who's just as dorky as he is. Bayonetta and John from Bayonetta. Childhood friends turned rivals thanks to some brainwashing. Jin, Kazuya, and Haihachi from Tekken. There isn't a therapist alive that can help this family work through their issues. Osura and Yasha from Osura's Wrath. Makes you wonder why Yasha was against you to begin with, but hey, at least the fights were awesome. Ragna and Jin Kisaragi from Blaze Blue. Good rivalry, but feels like Diet Dante and Virgil. Yeah, I'm not of my rivals. How could it not be them? Devil May Cry is a quintessential gaming franchise that has been influential throughout gaming. Gameplay that's both innovative and fun, cutscenes that are action-packed and energized, and a story that is both deep and gripping in spite of its over-the-top nature. And of course, it features one of the most iconic rivalries between the protagonist Dante and his twin brother Virgil. Dante is a laid-back devil hunter with a devil may care, oh now I get it, approach to combat. Virgil is an uptight devil bringer with a surgical approach to combat. Ever since childhood, they've opposed each other on a fundamental level. Dante favored his human mother, while Virgil respected his father's demon lineage. When their home was attacked by the forces of Mundus, their mother was able to save Dante, but Virgil was claimed by the devils. Virgil goes throughout his 
life seeking additional demonic power. Unfortunately, this contrasts with Dante trying to protect humanity as Virgil's goals tend to occur without any regard to other people. While they've worked together at times, the two have always had a clash of ideals one way or another. The funny thing is, their rivalry doesn't seem to be all that personal. I mean, it is a little personal, but it feels more like they simply disagree with each other, and fighting is the only way they seem to know how to express that. I mean, hey, it's not like they can actually kill each other. By Devil May Cry 5, Virgil doesn't seem as power hungry as he used to be. He reflects on his actions in Devil May Cry 3 and 1 and wonders how things might have changed if he was saved that day instead of Dante. Although they will never, ever admit it, both Dante and Virgil respect each other as rivals. Virgil always eagerly awaits his brother's arrival to his parties and Dante is giddy to see what his brother has in store for him. This currently culminates at the end of Devil May Cry 5, where Dante and Virgil have one more showdown with intent to kill, only to be stopped by Nero. The revelation of Nero being his son and the time he spent as V finally mellowed Virgil out where he will work with Dante toward a common goal, even if it traps both of them in the netherworld. Their last scene is where the two of them are friendly sparring in between dealing with demon hordes. They finally admit they respect each other, even if they don't outright say it. I am so glad that DMC5 gave us a true conclusion to their rivalry since all we had was what happened in 3 and 1. Virgil became Nello Angelo and was killed by Dante without realizing he was Virgil until it was too late. It's why these two are number one and why we get some of the best fights in gaming as a result of it. I'm Josh Scorcher and I'm glad my rivals on YouTube are all friendly as we work alongside each other to give you the best content we can. Even if they keep breaking my window whenever we collab. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>